have uh, one more witness. I, my direct will certainly be done before. Five. Uh, we call Alan Lambeth. And we're going to go back to the Karst Finder. Good afternoon. Down. Who is your current employer? Corporate Spectre Energy. What is your current title or position? I'm Director of Engineering Design. Are you a professional engineer? I am. What is your current responsibilities and duties? So I have a group of engineers in the Houston office for Spectre Energy, and those engineers are responsible for all of the design work on our pipelines and compressor stations. And we have several dozen engineers, and they uh, we hire engineering consultants who specialize in that area, and my, my direct role is to administer our procedures, make sure everything's been done the way we do things, and uh, I also get very involved in a lot of uh, you know, the, routine, the routine things I don't get mixed up with, but I get involved with the, the bigger challenges and issues that come along. Hey, can you please describe your role in the Sable Trail Pipeline project? The Sable Trail Pipeline job I was involved in the early stages of the project two and a half years ago as we were starting to talk about the project and looking at what would be involved and uh, starting the investigations of uh, looking at the details of Florida, which, which we had not been built pipeline before. Uh, then uh, we uh, worked with an uh, engineer who we have assigned the engineer working on, and my staff is uh, 62 years old, many years of experience. And so uh, he and I talked about compared ideas. We, a lot of the work we do is a teamwork approach to doing things where it's not just one guy goes and do it, does it. It's a lot of, a lot of experts sit down and talk about what we do and, and uh, what's relevant. Uh, we looked at the, uh, the proposed routing uh, and I was, I was personally involved in that. And as the project gets further and further along, then I get back, I back out of the details and so I'm not involved in the individual little reroutes. I'm not really involved in the, the big picture issues. I am involved when we talk about HPDs, uh, get involved and make sure that everything is going well on the project and if there's question marks, uh, that engineer actually sits right across from the hall from me. We, we do probably talk uh, at least once or twice a week about one thing or another on the project. And can you briefly summarize your experience with pipeline design? Uh, pipeline design, uh, I've, I have uh, Actually, uh, 18 years of engineering design experience. I, I was the manager of pipeline design for 10 years, and, uh, and then about four years ago, I was promoted to director where I then picked up uh, pipeline, as well as pipeline design, also our compressor station design work, and also I'm responsible for our MNR station design work. So I've designed facilities for many years. Uh, I, I don't directly design them now, but I consult with engineers and in the design and the details, and uh, when there's question marks that come up. And can you describe your, uh, summarize your experience with pipeline operations? Uh, yeah, I also uh, spent 10 years in pipeline operations. I started out in the technical services group as a the pipeline engineer responsible for pipeline integrity across our entire pipeline system. After a year doing that work, and, and it's, uh, in that work, uh, your, your role is to support all of the field operations on any technical issues that come up. Uh, also, uh, very involved with the inline inspection tool runs, the corrosion control, and then I was promoted to being the manager of that group and was the manager of that the technical services group for four years. So, any types of issues that come out, uh, that happen out in, in the, the field, and problems, question marks that come up, technical questions. We would address that. We also wrote all of the operating procedures and maintain and up, up improve those over the years. Uh, then uh, you know, I spent the next five years as an area manager uh, of a pipe, part of our pipeline system, much like, say, the Trable, Sable Trail Pipeline, 
where uh, I had about 1,000 miles of pipelines, uh, as much as eight compressor stations, the boundaries changed a little here and there, around 100 meter stations in my area. And so several supervisors worked for me, and uh, then you know the guys out there who were actually doing all the operations and maintenance tasks, uh, doing all the, you know, making sure everything works every day, and following the operating procedures. Uh, that, that was my responsibility to travel around in the different areas and, and support them and uh, help administrate the uh, operations. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer Mr. Lambeth as an expert in the field of natural gas pipeline design and operation. Any objection? He's accepted. Cut straight to the chase, Alan. Is it your understanding the pipeline will be installed uh, in Karst Train in Florida? Uh, yes, I'm well aware of that. Uh, what was it, two and a half years ago, as we started looking at the project, as we do with many projects, and we, you know, we have uh, installed many pipelines in Karst areas, and that's one of the things you look for is uh, what will uh, what will be the, the issues on this pipeline, and what's a little bit different here and there. And yes, we were well aware that this was in Karst. And let's step back for a second. What type of pipe is he's going to be using in Florida? Uh, it is carbon steel pipe, but let, let me add a little bit more to that. And it's 30 inch o, uh, 36 inch OD. And the, uh, the, the uh, pipe we use is high strength uh, modern ductile pipe. And the, those are uh, carbon steel pipe can range anywhere from lesser grades, you know, like the steel and the, the microphone is probably a mild steel. The, the steel we're using in our pipeline is probably twice that strong. It's also uh, very du uh, du modern duct, I say modern because uh, over the years steel production and steel has improved very much to where duct will, you know, if I pull on this right here a little bit, it's going to bend a little bit, right? Whereas in the old days steel was a little more brittle, and so modern steel is much more forgiving than uh, older pipe vintage. And does Sable Trail have specific specifications for the steel that it acquires for this pipeline? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we the, the steel we use. Number one, the, the, there's a, several aspects of that. The steel we source, we only go to the best steel producers around, and, and we're, we're talking in the world that the top steel producers and uh, have a, a, a about a 30-page specification for our pipe. And uh, we all only go to the top pipe mills. We audit all of our top pipe mills, make sure they're top quality producers. Uh, this project, uh, Berg Steel, which is in Panama City, Florida, as a matter of fact, is producing the vast majority of the, the pipe. Uh, they are one of the top quality steel mills in the, in the world. Uh, not only do we provide an extensive specification to them on the requirements, but we also uh, put a, a, an inspector in the mill uh, that represents us, that oversees the mill production and the steel and uh, all the testing that we have. Uh, we test the uh, steel for strength. We verify that it is what it's supposed to be. Strength, toughness, there's tests we do to ensure that it is the tough steel. And uh, the, the bendability, there's various tests that are put through. Uh, API 5L is a uh, required specification <coughs> required by the industry and by the federal government. We have many requirements that are above and beyond the requirements of the API 5L specifications. And Mr. Bass earlier testified that there are various classes of the, the pipe, I think, relates to the thickness of it. Um, can you just briefly describe what those classes are? Uh, you know, the classes defined in the federal regulations and actually the state regulations, same thing. Uh, it's, it's dependent upon the population density in the area. So, uh, what we do is we are designing the pipeline and we do surveys of the population density in the areas. And if it's a very out, we're out in the middle of nowhere, we would call that a class one. There's maybe a few houses in the area. As the population density increases, we go to a, a class two area. And then as, as we get into areas where you're, you know, you're going to a town, there's lots of houses around, that would be a class three area. And the regulations also have one more class uh, location, class four. And that's really if you're going through downtown Jacksonville, somewhere where there are predominant big buildings around and such, that would be a class four area. The, the class three pipe is thicker than the class one. Yeah. So the uh, the the requirements are as you go go into those higher population densities that you add more thickness to your pipe. We're using the high strength steel, high high quality pipe everywhere, but as we go into the uh, higher population densities, we go actually with a thicker pipe. 
And to your understanding, what class of pipe will we use for the HDD crossings and the Swanee and Santa Fe rivers? Yeah, the HDD pipe, even though they are you not. Said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said pipe density first, and then you said pipe thickness. Um, if I said density, that was a misspeak. Yeah, I'm sorry. That, yeah, the thickness of the pipe is. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where I said pipe density. Yeah, the, the pipe. Yeah, just for, just to make sure we're all clear, the pipe in the higher class areas will be thicker based upon the regulate requirements of the regulation. We also use a thicker pipe in uh, quite a few other areas. An uh, example would be in HDD crossings. I might, uh, you might have maybe talked about population density. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, population density, maybe I have uh, this book there. Sorry, Mr. Riley, go ahead. Is pipe specifically talking about the HDD crossing and, and karst areas? Are pipes specifically designed to for karst areas? Uh, you know, we we'll look at the karst areas and identify any any types of risks. And karst uh, basically, uh, we don't really do a lot different in a karst area, and that's because the the uh, pipe the pipe is designed primarily based upon the pressure inside the pipe. And so that, and to make sure that is the pipe is absolutely safe from that pressure, but that's a, that's an orientation that stresses the steel in a, in a hoop direction, you know, circumferentially. And and as we do that, the pipe also has a lot of strength and the longitudinal strength. It's just as strong in that direction, but the internal pressure doesn't load it. You know, doesn't apply a lot of stress in the longitudinal direction. So, pipe has a uh, a great ability to span great distances and without. You know, I don't even think twice about. Uh, if I've got a 30-foot span. We, I mean, we we design, we we build pipes all the time that have a lot of very span lengths. I'm going to run the calculations on 30 feet because it's. I mean, I've done it so many times. I know it's not even, not anywhere of a challenge for the pipe to uh, span 30 feet. Well, talking about your experience, if you turn to uh, tab 32, which is Sable 12 Exhibit 32, which has already been entered into evidence. I only go to 25. Mm -hmm. Does he have the right? It's got fresh. Yeah, at least I can talk. Oh, okay. That's backward. You are. Tied it upside down. Yes, okay, I've got it. Referring to that figure, what experience does the industry have installing natural gas pipelines in karst areas? So the map you're looking at here is a, a map that is uh, geo-referenced, pipelines 20 inches and larger in the eastern part of the United States, and overlaying a USGS map that shows karst areas, and these are areas that uh, obviously down in the Florida, you see them in Tennessee, you see them up in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky. Uh, there, are, there are literally thousands of miles, and uh, many of these pipeline systems have multiple pipelines. There are literally thousands of miles of pipelines that install in karst areas. Um, is the karst areas depicted uh, in the blue? Just so we yes, are yeah, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, so the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the blue, the green, and there's a light blue, all of those areas are karst and carbonate type rocks that will dissolve with, uh, you know, through pH, low pH water. And uh, those are, you know, near the surface, within 50 feet of the surface, you know, different levels in there, but they're, they're all areas that, that uh, where karst areas could actually impact the pipelines that are, uh, that are built in those areas. Do you have an opinion as to whether uh, the pipeline can be uh, strike that? Do you have any concerns about installing the pipeline? that may result in forming new or expanding sinkholes under or near the pipeline that could result in pipeline development? <coughs> uh, absolutely not on the failure part. Uh, pipelines and karst areas, is there a possibility that the trench might cause a little change in water flow? Uh, you know, as we drill on HPD, there's been a lot of testimony around that, but 
you know, could it in fact, uh, in fact be sinkhole a little bit here and there? Uh, I don't, I don't disagree that couldn't happen with the, all the different types of geology out there. Uh, but as far as impacting any danger to the pipeline, I see absolutely no uh, threat to the pipeline from being in the karst area. And can you explain the basis for your opinion? Yeah, I've, I've run many calculations of spans and uh, over the years, and for a variety of different purposes. And uh, I've run numbers for pipelines to you know there were you know if you even opened up a, a major sinkhole that caved away and left several couple hundred foot span of pipe, the pipe would still be within design guidelines, and so it would not be a, a threat to the pipeline. I'd, I'd jump in real quickly and probably cut the pressure and take action on that, obviously, but uh, it would not actually threat, threaten the integrity of the pipeline. I'm sorry? Including any joints? Yeah, the, uh, the joints, uh, in, you know, the, uh, the, the, the welder who spoke here earlier, we'll talk about the joints for just a minute, uh, he actually did pass an API 1104. He may not have ever heard of it that way, but API 1104 is the regulations that the, that the USDOT requires that we follow on all of our welding and welding inspection. In order to pass that weld, you have to be a pretty good welder, so the guy obviously had, had the talent in, in performing welds. Uh, we x-ray every one of the welds we do, and uh, the uh, x-rays are reviewed not only by the required level two x-ray technician required, but we actually have an x-ray level three technician review all of our x-rays looking for any signs of defects. Uh, we actually interpret defects based upon welder quality. Uh, you know, we're expecting a quali quality of the welder, but as far as the defect, defects, you know, we'll, we, we, you know, we reject small stuff that integrity-wise is not really even a threat to the pipeline. So the uh, welds are repaired if there are defects that see levels that weren't even a, a, a threat to the pipe anyway, a very tiny defects. Uh, the, uh, also, the, uh, the welding procedures we use and, and the, weld, you know, the, the testing that the welder has to go through, and uh, we use the same levels of, of criteria on the weld itself, but uh, the, uh, we, take, we cut straps out of the welds that the welders produce as they qualify to work on our pipeline. We pull them, we bend them, we cut them in half looking for defects, and uh, they, they are put through a very rigorous test. As a matter of fact, many welders are not able to pass that test. There was testimony earlier about coatings on the pipeline. What coatings are added to the pipe? So, yeah, the modern coatings we use are a, uh, a thin film of epoxy, and that uh, coating is, it's not baked on, but it actually is applied hot in a, in a mill. Uh, that coating is then inspected in the mill to verify that it is uh, a sound integrity. And then uh, we, uh, we also inspect that coating again during construction. We inspect that coating again as the pipe has been being lowered into the additional trench line. We inspect that coating again with electronic above ground coating survey after the the, uh, the pipeline has uh, been buried to verify that coating is in good condition. What is the purpose of the coating? Uh, coating is for cathodic protection. Uh, let, let me add on uh, one more comment: is the, uh, the the pipe and the HDDs also has a triple layer thick coating on top of that that is. Uh, as a, especially designed for that application. It is a, a especially hard and abrasion resistant, very tough code. What is the purpose of the yeah, code? Yeah, the, yeah, the coating yeah, the coating is one of uh, many parts of our uh, we, different methods we use to protect our pipeline from corrosion. Is that part of cathodic protection? Uh, it works in combination with cathodic protection to protect the pipeline. Is there cathodic protection on the pipeline? Yes, sir. And can you describe what that is? Yeah, cathodic protection is um, in a press current protection system. You know, the, the, uh, the, the gentleman earlier talked about uh, use of, uh, you know, what do you call them, zinc packs or whatever they are, uh, and anodes is what we call those. And so uh, cathodic protection is used in combination. And that's just one, uh, what he talked about was one method that we use a little bit, but it's really not the most effective method to protect a big long pipeline. He, he spoke from his own experience, what he had seen. But what we uh, typically, and what we will be using for the uh, Sable Trail Pipeline <coughs> is compressed current. Compressed current is a, is a system where uh, we bring in electrical current 
into a rectifier that converts AC power to DC. And uh, we, we connect a wire to the pipe. And then we actually, through anodes, impress a current out into the ground. And so if there is any, any little scratch or something in the coating, you know, anywhere along that pipeline, and these, this, this will protect the pipeline for you know, 10 miles in either direction, 10, 15 miles. And so uh, if there's any defect in that area, the current will move from, because we have a negative lead and we put a positive flow on the anodes, it will move from the anode to the pipe, complete the circuit. So by having current moving to the pipe, it's the opposite of current coming off the pipe, which would be corrosion. And so it's electron flow to the pipe, and you actually have a little calcareous buildup at that point if that were to occur. It's just a tiny trickle of electricity. If you think of a, a, a battery from a flashlight, is 1.5 volt. You can touch it, you don't even feel it. 0.85 is all the current I need. And we, we do uh, surveys periodically as part of our maintenance program to go out and establish that uh, that system is effective. In fact, we do a, a complete survey right after the pipeline is put into service where we walk along doing the, uh, checking the, uh, the ability of the current to reach the different areas along the pipeline. And uh, that is a requirement in the regulations that we are inspected to every, every year as the, the inspectors from PIMS, uh, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration as the enforcement branch of the DOT as they come out and do their annual audits. They'll, they'll go through those diligently and very thoroughly go through those records and make sure we are maintaining the proper provider protection on our pipelines. All right. Thanks, Alan. I want to get back to the, the HDD crossings at the Suwannee and, and the Santa Fe River. In your opinion, do you believe the pipeline can be installed underneath the Suwannee and Santa Fe Rivers using HDD? Uh, I am very confident we can do that. We have installed much more difficult crossings. Uh, will the cars uh, possibly make things a little more tricky during construction? Yeah, that, that, but HDDs, all HDDs, are, can be a little difficult for one reason or another. The karst uh, conditions is one minor risk. Uh, the core borings we did actually found no voids. I, I won't say there aren't, but... So is it clear the core borings for these crossings. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I, I reviewed them myself and, and uh, looked those over. There were no no uh, no voids. Uh, there are there will I'm sure there will be areas where we uh, I'm highly confident there will be a few areas in there based upon the resistivity studies that were talked about earlier that there could be some areas where there's a little sand and gravel. Uh, those can make things a little more difficult, but uh, nothing we haven't been through many times before. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, to add further to my confidence, uh, we've actually completed uh, over 20 HDD installations in karst areas in the past. So in your opinion, the design of the pipe is capable of operating <coughs> underneath these two rivers? Uh, that, that is correct. Uh, in, in fact, the, uh, during the installation and the pressure testing that Marty talked about following the test, that we, we will, uh, we will, we will uh, torture that pipe much more than it will we'll ever see during in service. Thank you. I have no further questions. None from the report. All right. Ross? Okay. Um, Mr. Lambeth, you uh, showed us uh, what is marked as uh, uh, tab 32 of exhibit, the uh, course exhibit. Yes, sir. Uh, if I understand correctly, the blue and some of the green are uh, pipelines uh, on cars terrain in the U.S. and including Florida? That's correct. Have you ever had any uh, uh, trouble with uh, internal corrosion on any of those pipelines? Um, those are a, a lot of pipelines by, built by a lot of companies. Uh, we have had areas where well, we have... Sir, so the, what we're looking at... You said not, those, those, pipelines, those are not uh, necessarily... Spectra Energy's pipelines are among those. Those are pipelines built by many companies. Just to demonstrate that there are many miles, or thousands of miles, of pipelines safely operating in karst areas. So, you know, I would move to, uh, to strike the test that we had, uh, uh, I, in that it's not uh, illust illustrative of the, uh, the petitioner's pipelines. Uh, I'm also concerned that the testimony we heard all predominantly goes to safety, and it's unclear to me uh, on the court's order on safety uh, as to why, uh, whether or not this opens the door for us to discuss safety. Uh, can, 
we never represented those were all state and trust pipelines. And the exhibit's already been entered into evidence. And the testimony wasn't about safety. It was about the design characteristics as it relates to crossing car-sensitive area and the HDD process. Well, we used the word safety. I thought it was about safety. Well, I'm not making any findings about safety, pipeline safety, except as it affects, uh, I mean, potential effects on the environment and human use of water resources. If I understand correctly, since the court's making no findings on safety, the any testimony on safety is, uh, need not be responded to? Correct. Thank you, Ron. Nothing further? Can I redirect? Nothing further, sir. Thank you, sir. Can I just have one more, Your Honor? Thank <laughs> you.